Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to the 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Who's got it better than us? Nobody! Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Coming up on this week's Game Day Edition, my guest is Anthony Broom from our partner at SB Nation's Maize and Brew. But first, my view from Section 17 to get us going. Well, the more people I talked with last week, the more I thought we were in for a battle in Madison. A lot of people that know a lot more about football than I do thought that this team, Wisconsin, was vastly underrated and very good. Still, none of us expected what we saw. And I haven't spent much time thinking about what I saw at Camp Randall Stadium on Saturday since the game. I've been watching Michigan football since the 60s, and that loss has to rank in my top 10 absolute nightmare games. I'm not sure what's going on with this team. I'm not sure if it can be fixed quickly. I simply have no idea. But I hope someone does. At his presser today, Monday, Jim took full responsibility for the debacle, and he should. Uh, As they say, this is his baby, and he has to rock it. There is absolutely no excuse for what we saw on Saturday. Our record against ranked teams is abysmal over the last five years. That's at home and on the road. We just can't seem to win big games, and it is disheartening. So it is what it is at this point. And Jim Harbaugh has to get it back on track and fixed and fast. It helps that Rutgers is coming in on Saturday, but the way we're playing, we best not take these guys for granted either. We just aren't good enough to do that right now. So I think you get my drift. Like you, I could go on and on about this right now, and it won't do a darn bit of good. My guest today says he is also at a loss as to what's happening with this Michigan football team. Like all of us, He knows something is broken, and it needs to get fixed and fast. Anthony Broom of SB Nation's Maize and Brew is up next here on this week's game day show here on The Michigan Man in partnership with that very same Maize and Brew. Here with us on our game day segment this week as we take a look back at Wisconsin, as painful as that was, and a peek uh, ahead to this week's game with Rutgers is Anthony Broom from Maize and Brew. Anthony, once again, good to have you back on the show. Good to be back. Wish it were under more positive circumstances, but uh, we, we persist nonetheless. Still very hard to process, isn't it, Anthony? Yeah, and even when things, so many things go so wrong all at once, you know, we're in media or, or people that watch and follow the games. You try to come up with takeaways, mm-hmm. and 
you just can't. Like, there's nothing there. The only thing you can possibly take away from that game is when they started moving the ball late in the game. Mind you, it was game was already well in doubt or well in well in the hand of the Badgers. They started going, you know, they started using the wide receivers they have, which is like if there's any sliver of hope or positivity to glean from that game. That was probably it. But other than that, like top to bottom coaching, execution, players, turnovers, just a total unabashed disaster. Well, let's start talking about that offense. Um, we expected some kind of a learning curve uh, early in the season. I know everyone hates to quote Urban Meyer, but he said uh, he thought you know five to six games would be reasonable for getting the kinks out. I'm not sure what's happening. I don't know if anyone does know what, what's happening. This offense is just not working right now, is it? I'm not sure if it's because the scheme isn't good or what they want to do isn't working, but... The thing that continues to baffle me is that, you know, they fumbled on the opening drive now in all three of their games, and those have all come within the first, you know, one to four plays of a of a series. And you're not even – they're not even giving themselves a chance to settle into an offense to get any rhythm going. Um, the self-inflicted wounds, the fumbles, the um, – you know, Shea Patterson now through three games, you know, he fires one up high to Nico Collins in the end zone. That's a throw a quarterback needs to make, like period. And the mental mistakes and the miscues and um, you know I, I, some of what we saw against Middle Tennessee was concerning for sure, but it was one of those things where like okay, they were amped up. It was the opening game. We'll see how they come out uh, moving forward. And it's not a concern until it becomes a trend. And um, not only has it become a trend, but it's been trending downward in a big way. So um, I don't I don't know if this team knows what it wants to be right now. Uh, it's pretty clear they don't know what they are. Uh, but I think, and this isn't defending Josh Gaddis or the offense or anything, but mm-hmm. um, before they even got a chance to settle into the offense, before they even got off the play script, they were down 14 to nothing. So it's um, it's hard to stomach. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the fix is because everything is going wrong. A total uh, implosion on Saturday, and we'll talk about Shea in a minute because he seems to be bearing the brunt of uh, a lot of the fans' wrath. But the more pressing issue to me is uh, the offensive line. And you, when you get behind like we did on Saturday, you're, you, you're going to have issues anyway. But in the first two games, when you look back, they were okay. Again, you have a couple of youngsters, and you're playing without John Runyon Jr., so you expect you're going to have a, a few glitches here and there. But through three games, you just can't sugarcoat it. What we saw on Saturday was uh, not even an average performance. It just they looked lost, didn't they? Yeah, abysmal and, and really, quite frankly, inexcusable. Given that you have and running was back, you have four guys from left to right that were all Big Ten caliber type of guys, and they I know last year didn't start out great for them, but they got better every week. And by the end of the year, you were looking at you know one of the better offensive lines in college football, and I know. With a, you know, with an offense change, some of their responsibilities change a little bit. But um, to have so many, I mean, Cesar Ruiz is a junior. Bredesen and Onwenu are, are seniors. John Runyon's a fifth-year senior. To have those guys playing as poorly as they are, um, that is that is so eye-opening and concerning. And that is kind of the theme of, I guess, all the issues mm-hmm. they're having. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what's going on there. It's it's really odd. It's really you know that's that's where it all starts. If you can't block, you can't do anything well. And, and we thought and coming into this year, we, we thought there was a chance. This is you know perhaps the best offensive line they've had in what ten, eleven, twelve years. Mm-hmm. And to to trend downward as as quickly as they have. And listen, I know um, I thought they were okay to good against in the, in the opener against Army. That's a defense that sends pressure just about every play, and you've got you had two redshirt freshman tackles. So you're like, okay, I kind of get it. But uh, and I know Wisconsin. That's not to take anything away from Wisconsin, but you're supposed to physically be their equal and talent wise be superior to them, and they just weren't. So again, Ed Warner has to do a better job, I guess. Jim Harbaugh just across the board, it's just an absolute nightmare. Well, let's talk about Shea Patterson for a minute. You know, midweek. He said he was 100%. He was ready to go, which is sort of hard to believe because that oblique injury just, it lingers and lingers. Uh, 
if you talk to most doctors, they'll say it's a, an injury that you have to rest. It just doesn't go away quickly. And this is supposed to be, as we have all heard, an offense that's perfectly suited to his skills. But when you watch him play, I, I don't know that if he's lost in that offense right now or he really is hurt, but he just is just so out of sync, isn't he? He is, and it's an injury that they maintain, Michigan maintains, he maintains, that shouldn't be holding him back. And uh, to a certain extent, I don't, I don't see how it isn't holding him back. But and I also, things to me, when you look at Shea Patterson, whatever it is, things are not processing quickly enough. Like, yeah, this skill set for what it looks like they want to do is, is pretty well suited for what a guy of his caliber can do. You have really good arm talent. You are mobile can be a little bit of a dual threat but if you're not making the correct reads or reading the defense as quickly as you need to there are more than a handful of plays out of that game and really from the first three games of the year where um you know you look at the the route tree that everyone's kind of running and there's a couple guys wide open but he, yet he's locked onto a you know a ronnie bell or a sean McHugh and, instead of maybe someone down the sideline there was a play on saturday where a defensive back literally had just fell down and was wide and Nico Collins is wide open and Shea just doesn't see it. He's not seeing, he's not, I don't, I'm not even sure if he's seeing a quarter of the field right now. Like, I don't know if it's things are happening too quickly or he's hurt and can't focus, but um, I think through three games, he's seen kind of what you need to see. And if it's true that if he truly is hurt to where it is impacting his ability to read and do all these things, he can't play period. And I know that now you've got an injured Dylan McCaffrey, but um, if Shea Patterson is so hurt that that's what you're going to get out of him, he can't be on the field. Well, I think what frustrates fans, I know it frustrates them, is other schools have made offensive changes in the the offseason, such as LSU. That's the one you can point at. I think uh, most noticeably they are better. Josh Gaddis is a first-time OC. We do know that. And we expected more than this three weeks into the season, but is it too early to say Gaddis might might be in over his head as far as game calling? To a certain extent, I'd say yes. Um, like I said, this one this week, I think it was one that just kind of got away from him with another bad turnover early, with the defense not being able to kind of um, lock things down and, and slow down the Wisconsin attack. Um, you know, like I said, when you de- you develop as a play, a uh, feel as a play caller when you're able to have some rhythm offensively and you can um, start doing some different things. But I mean, I don't know. I don't, I'll put it this way. I don't know whose decision it was to have Ben Mason take your first carry of the game out of the shotgun from seven yards out. A guy who's been repping with the defensive tackles all fall. He has not played any running back or fullback in any games at this point. And he gets your first carry of the game. That's, I don't know if that's a Gaddis thing or that's a Harbaugh thing, but that's kind of like the textbook overthinking that has led to a lot of these self-inflicted mistakes. Mm-hmm. And Jim Harbaugh maintains that this is Josh Gaddis's offense, so um, I will, you know, that I think that blame is is very fair to be put on him. Um, so I don't know. He just doesn't. The, the feel isn't quite there. I don't know why. Like I said, the offense isn't doing themselves any favors in terms of the self-inflicted mistakes, the fumbles. Um, you know, it's just, like I said, it, it's, yeah. it's hard to pinpoint across the board, but he's the easiest guy to go after because um, he is the new guy. And it's this is, I think, what bothers me the most is that coming off of last year, this was a Michigan team where you're like, you know, it was a pretty efficient offense. I think it was, you know, somewhere between 25th and 30th nationally in terms of like the, the efficiency rankings. And all they really needed to do was – utilize the personnel they had a little bit better. Hey, maybe on this third down here, let's use our wide receivers instead of, you know, pounding the rock and trying to run up the middle or whatever it was. Um, they needed a little more, um, you know, a little more of a, a dual edged attack in terms of we're going to pass the ball. We're going to throw the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they're going, if they truly went to a new offense where they changed the entire scheme and are going full spread and, and they're doing that in a year where, you know, everyone in that building knows that this is a very important year for Jim Harbaugh and for this program. And if they, you know, to think that um, they would have the time to kind of work this into what they want it to be and maybe lose some games in the process, I think that's a little bit crazy, quite frankly. Uh, you probably could have peeled things back a little bit more slowly. 
uh, LSU last year. I know everyone's making a big deal this year about look at how up-tempo LSU's offense is and they're using their wide receivers. This transition for them started last year, and they peeled things back a little bit more slowly and then unleashed the full offense in the offseason. So when you talk about in over your head or uh, things happening too quickly, like I think this might be an example of that. Well, the defense is another matter. Uh, even if some of us expected the offense to struggle, uh, Don Brown's defense, I mean, his style is the same wherever he's been. It's not changed much at all since he's been here. It's attack, attack, attack. The knock on this defense um, is it's effective against uh, inferior athletes a lot of the time. But uh, when an offense is you know, equally as talented, uh, it struggles, it gets exposed. Do you think that's true? the tape would support that especially yeah. in the last two years or so uh, and I think this is what bothers me most about the defense and that now I don't want to take any credit away the game plan that they had for Army was terrific I thought that the defense played excellent I thought that that was you know considering the circumstances one of Don Brown's better like having the team prepared and you know performances of his time at Michigan so then he comes out after that game media availability during the bye week and you know, talk to the media and is feeling pretty good about himself saying, um, you know, just kind of feeling himself a little bit in terms of, yeah, Wisconsin, uh, that's a team we're, we're excited to get back to Wisconsin because they do things that we're used to seeing and things we're going to see in the big 10 and we're, we'll be fine. We're going to execute it at a high level. We're excited for that. Um, so right off the bat, you know, the attitude was kind of, we're going to be fine because this is what we've always stopped and this is what we do well. And then you come out like that, and, and you get punched in the mouth. And that's that's incredibly concerning uh, because it's, like like I've been echoing to everyone on a variety of issues, it's not a concern until it becomes a trend. And in the last three games that Michigan has played against a Power 5 school, obviously we know what happened at Ohio State. We know what happened in the bowl game against Florida. And then now we know what happened on Saturday. So um, teams are starting to use – Teams are the book is out on that defense, and it has been. Like teams will use that aggressiveness against them, um, and the inability, or I don't know if it's an inability to an adjust or if it's an unwillingness to adjust. I'm not sure which one is more disturbing to me, but uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, they are kind of set in their ways there, and when they go up against teams that can challenge them and can kind of push them around a little bit, they they tend to crumble and. You know, like I said, the tape will support that. So um, I don't know what the fix is there. Don Brown's the type of guy where I don't really see that changing now. But if that continues throughout the year um, in these bigger games that they play, because, man, you look at that schedule, there's a lot of them coming. That's mm -hmm. maybe maybe that's it here. You know, what I found alarming was Charles Woodson's in-game and post-game analysis. Uh, he said the defense was out of position. The corners were using poor technique. The D-line was physically too small to hold up against Big Ten offenses. And then he said they are not prepared to coach properly. And coming from someone like Charles Woodson on national television, I did not expect that. That was just a big slam on Don Brown. Oh, absolutely. And when you see, I mean, not just Charles Woodson. You had Steve Hutchinson tweeting things out. Jake Long tweeting things out. And it wasn't negative, like maybe some of the stuff we saw um, with Braylon last year, but this was, you know, it's concerning enough to where, and really what for Don Brown, the defense, the offense, whatever it is, what that game really did, I think was even the most rational of people, which, you know, maybe um, this can be debated or not. I would consider myself in that camp, but I think even the most rational people are kind of like, you know, they were in the wait and see mode. They wanted to kind of let things play out. And a lot of people have been saying a lot of the things that they are about Jim Harbaugh and Michigan football for a while. But I think there was a pretty pretty decent chunk of people that were like, okay, let's let this play out, see what happens. And to come out like that, I mean, even the most you know, level-headed of people um, who were willing to give them as many chances as they can. And mind you, it's one loss. It's the third game of the season. But um, that was... I think it would be a lot easier to stomach if they went into Madison, played hard, competed, and lost close. And you don't want that to happen because, obviously, if you lose close, it means there's something you could have done along the lines. But to come out and be thoroughly outmanned, outclassed, outcoached, as they said, and, and pretty much every phase of the game is disheartening. And, and it's when you start seeing 
the guys who wore that helmet before coming out and saying that, and you know, Charles Woodson used the term embarrassed. Um, that's a pretty that's a pretty damning mark on on where things are at right now. Well, in the Detroit Free Press on Sunday, Sean Windsor um, made a comment that Jim Harbaugh has or appears to have no fire in his belly, and I would I would not go there, but he did. He said he just looked you know blank during the game and after the game, and it all starts at the top was as far as the fire and the passion. Do you find him sort of disconnected at times right now, at least when dealing with the media? And that's I know that's a tough question to answer. Yeah, it is tough because he can he can be that he was that way to a certain extent with the media, even when things were quote unquote going well. But right now it seems like um like you said, a little bit reserved, a little um I I don't know how to put it, but it's not, you know, a little bit defensive at times when, when asked a question um that he deems isn't fair or might not be um, something he wants to answer. I mean, I, I, I'll be straight up about it. I mean, a couple of weeks ago after the army game, uh, Nick Baumgartner of the athletic asked him about the offense and the approach in that second half. And they'd run the ball 14 straight times. And Jim Harbaugh took that as like a shot at him. And he called it low hanging fruit right there in the mm-hmm. press room. And that was, that was kind of jarring. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know what's going on there right now. I'm not going to go as far as to say the fire isn't there and he doesn't care about winning because nobody who coaches or nobody who plays at this high level doesn't care about winning. But um, it's pretty clear right now he doesn't know. Maybe he's pressing. The program's pressing. They don't have the answers. He doesn't have the answers. And as a result, that's when you see players with the deer in the headlights look and kind of just, you know, walking slowly out to the field for plays late in the blowout game. Um, there's not a lot of confidence there with anyone right now. And, and you think about Jim Harbaugh, that's a guy who you think of back to USC or when he, you know, we beat USC beats Pete Carroll, the what's your deal type thing. And then the slap on the back of Jim Schwartz when he was with the 49ers and a guy who was notorious for running up the score on teams and kind of just doing what he wanted to do because he wanted to do it. Um, I don't, I'm not going to say the fire's not there anymore, but I don't know where that guy went, I guess is how I'll put it. Well, you know, I hate to have this conversation three weeks into the season, and at Michigan I never thought we would have this conversation, not only early in the year, but at any point. But do you see after three games that after that kind of a loss Saturday that this team could be teetering and could go either way? Yeah, it certainly could go either way right now. I mean, as currently constructed, uh, and to a certain degree I think they will figure things out in terms of at least showing up ready to play. Um, yeah, I think this is still probably at least an eight win team, but it's definitely not a 10 win team. It's definitely not an 11, 12 win team that wins the big 10 goes to the college football playoff. And I think that's, if you go through the end of this year and, and you haven't beaten Ohio state and you haven't won the big 10 East, you're not going to Indy again. Um, I think it becomes a, you know, it becomes something where, we need to either have a discussion about what the expectations are and what they should be. Cause at that point it will be, you know, 15, 16 seasons without a big 10 title. It will be, you know, X amount of seasons without a win over Ohio state. It, it either becomes, is this what they just simply are right now? Or are they, ha- are they happy with this because money's coming in? Um, let's not take anything away from Jim Harbaugh, the way he builds the program. He's doing it the right way the experience he's, he's providing to these kids with overseas trips and, and things like that. Um, you know, and his thoughts on the transfer rule and, and being an advocate for that. Um, he's doing a lot of great things in that regard. And, and, you know, depending on what your criteria is certainly more good than bad. Uh, but if Michigan prides itself on being the, the quote unquote leaders and best, and, and they're not in terms of winning big 10 titles and, you know, doing big things on the national stage, I think it's fair to have a conversation moving forward about what those expectations are and, and what what the future is there. Well, looking ahead to Saturday, of course, Rutgers coming into town. It's a noon kickoff. Probably uh, just what the doctor ordered uh, in an opponent. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if there's a team in the Big Ten that can be named as the resident slump buster, that would certainly be the one. And we thought, um, you know, if we thought a bye week was as well placed as it wound up being uh, for week three, Obviously, that didn't go as well as we thought it would, but um, Rutgers is certainly a team that right now you just need to win a football game and you need to get rolling. And Rutgers is a team that, you know, regardless of how we think, how good we think Michigan is, um, 
Rutgers is terrible, and there's a good chance that you will have a the chance to kind of run the score up on them and and um, and things like that. So I mean, right now can't worry about what happens in the future. You got to take care of who you play Saturday. You got to take care of Iowa next week. You got to take care of Illinois on the road the week after that. Uh, I, I think if there's any sliver of hope that they can turn this season around, this three game stretch is where we need to see them start get rolling a little bit and heading into Penn State on October 19th. Because after that, I mean, then you get Notre Dame and then you go to Maryland, then you play Ohio or you play Michigan State, Ohio State. So um, if this team, this group of seniors, if, if this staff is capable of turning this around at all, the next three weeks need to be pretty impressive. And I know people will say, oh, well, it's just Rutgers. It doesn't matter. Or, oh, hey, uh, you know, Iowa's not that good. Or Illinois is terrible. It's like, you know what? Right now they just need to take care of the business that's in front of them. We can't look ahead to Penn State. Can't look ahead to Notre Dame or anything like that. Um, if this team looks impressive the next three weeks, you can at least feel somewhat confident that they can figure it out. But, you know, if they struggle against Rutgers, if they lose to Iowa, um, those the vocal people are start, are going to get a lot more vocal, and the people who aren't aren't so vocal are going to start speaking up as well. Final question for you, Anthony. I mean, we've heard this said so often, uh, not only in sports but in in other jobs, that you you just can't come home again. And Michigan fans wanted Jim Harbaugh to succeed so very much, but you know, coming back to the school and the program you played in, it doesn't always work, and we've seen that happen in, in other schools. We also know the job clock is not ticking for Jim. He's safe. But the fan base confidence in Jim being sort of a, the messianic type answer for Michigan football, I think that's maybe close to being exhausted, isn't it? I would think so. Um, if not totally exhausted, I think it's pretty close to that. Um, and again, I think that goes back to you know, no logical person. Like if they win nine or ten games, like there's you just don't get rid of that. Like It's a level of consistency that um, you know, at least things are, are somewhat stable here compared to how things have gone the last decade or so with, with the other coaches and, and how the Lloyd Carr era ended and all that. Um, I think it just becomes a a question of what are what should our expectations be? Because, like I said, and this is not a, a shot at anyone or a shot at how Michigan does business, but as long as they are happy with the way that the program is built and the money that's coming in, and, and some of the things that, that Harbaugh is still doing for the program, uh, I think he will. If he wants to, if he wants to walk away, I'm sure he could. But I don't. I just don't see a scenario unless the bottom completely falls out, which I still think this is a competent enough coaching staff that the bottom is not going to completely fall out. They might be disappointing. They might only win eight or nine games. But the people that say, "Oh, this might be a five or six or seven win football team." I don't see that. I, I think they have too many competent people in place for that to happen. And as long as they stay competent and stay somewhat relevant, um, I wouldn't expect anything to change. And I guess from there, I would just urge people to be patient or to lower your expectations. Cause I think at this point, this is really all you can do. Right. And, and, and you know, Jim Harbaugh is a competitor. That staff is very competitive and so are these kids on this team. So, as much as this hurts, we will probably, as fans, think about this longer than the team will and the coaching staff because they have to get ready for, for what's next, and they have to get better. They know all of these things. So, yeah, as hard as it is right now, probably the best approach is to just uh, chill out, wait until Saturday, take it a week at a time, and see how the team progresses because there still is a lot of football to be played, Anthony. And I'll say this, too. like You don't have to go back all that far to look for a team that has – started off the season really pretty disappointingly and won the Big Ten. Um, Penn State in 2016, they lose to Pitt. Then they come to the Big House, get totally destroyed. They lose 49-10, to 10, I think it was. And then from there, they don't lose again until the Rose Bowl. They beat Ohio State. They win the Big Ten. Uh, based on what we've seen right now, I don't know if this Michigan team is capable of that, but it has happened before. But you have to give yourself a chance to get rolling. And, you know, the first opportunity to do that is against Rutgers on Saturday and this is a a team that Jim Harbaugh teams have handled pretty thoroughly and I think that for as disheartening as, as that game might is is for the fans uh, uh -huh. the Wisconsin game and, and coming off of that um, I think the players I, I do think we'll see the players get up this week because they know listen 
we have we have a lot of frustrations, and we have someone come into town that is perfect to take them out on. So um, I would expect to see a fired up team, and you know, a team that kind of runs it up a little bit on Saturday. And people will say it doesn't matter, and to a certain extent, they'll be correct. But um, I think it's better to see them obviously take care of Rutgers than to squeak one out against Rutgers because I mean, looking at it objectively, Rutgers is probably by far the worst team that they've seen so far. So you need to take care of business and it needs to be thorough and it needs to be decisive. No, well, absolutely. It's going to be a very interesting week around here. And uh, yes, Saturday is a very important game. With us today on our game day segment, as we've looked back at uh, Wisconsin and a bit ahead towards the Rutgers is Anthony Broom from Maize and Brew. Anthony, always a pleasure to have you on the show. And I hope the next time you come back, uh, we're in a much better mood. That would be nice, from your lips to the the football gods' ears, my friend. Quick Hits is next as we wrap it up for another week here on The Michigan Man and in partnership with SB Nation's Maize and Brew. On Quick Hits today, Jim did address the injury situation, sort of, at his Monday presser. He said Dylan McCaffrey and Sean McCune are probable, as is True Wilson. Michael Dwumfor is practicing and working his way back. Whether that will be this week, Jim, wasn't certain. Shea Patterson is also listed as probable. If he can't go, and let's hope that doesn't happen, Joe Milton, who is now the backup, would be the man on Saturday. It's going to be a long week for all of us, uh, players and fans alike. Hopefully, uh, we're all in a better frame of mind by 12 noon on Saturday. Thanks again to my guest today, Anthony Broom, from our partner site, Maze and Brew. On Thursday's Visitor's Edition, we'll be joined by Steve Politi from the Newark Star-Ledger. He covers Rutgers football for the Ledger and was voted best sports columnist in America last year by the Associated Press, and he's a good guy, so make sure you join us on Thursday for that. A reminder, wherever you get your podcast, please take a minute or two to rate or comment on the show. We thank you in advance. That will do it for this week's game day show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Until we meet again on Thursday's Visitor's Edition, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at themichiganmanpodcast at yahoo.com. That's themichiganmanpodcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!